October 24, 1966, I went to see Ralph Graves, the managing editor of Life magazine, to ask him to send me to Aberfan. Ralph said that the story was already laid out in that week's issue with a cover picture, so my going was unnecessary. I pursued it, telling him I wanted to explore with my camera what it's like in a town without children. So, I came to Aberfan. The village was hostile ground, sad, angry, wet and cold, half of it still covered in grime from the tip's fallen slurry. I didn't know any of the villages, but I was about to meet most of them and to document their shock and grief and the stirrings of life after so much loss. I would be making Aberfan my home for several weeks. At the foot of Moy Road, just opposite the site of the landslide, Life London Bureau Chief Jim Hicks and I entered the Macintosh Hotel. We met Stanley Crow, owner of the Mac. We also had our first encounter with the local people reluctant to help us. Because of some of the earlier press had acted terribly towards the villages, Stanley wanted no part of us. Stan had no idea where we could stay. The Mac, he told us, was actually only a pub and a very popular one. Mirtha is the nearest place with a proper hotel if it isn't closed. It's 15 minutes up the road. But Stan's wife, Pearl, saw something special in us and thought we weren't like the others. After all, we were Yanks, and she had a room on the top floor. Every morning, before the tragic landslide, as well as after the event, Jack the Milk made his early rounds on cold and damp and empty streets. Not a child in sight. Jack's daughter Janet died in the pant glass school, but it didn't stop him from working. For him, work soothed his broken heart. Jack's father, Will the Milk, was filling in for Jack's wife, who could no longer face the routine of meeting others who had lost their children. You can tell families that lost children by their milk orders, but not just because they have fewer mouths to feed. It's also that they aren't eating right since this thing happened. He reckoned he was off 14 crates a week. Thus, 14 crates a week became a measure of sorrow. Sorry, Jack, just three pints. The streets continued to be empty of children. It was as if my story suggestion to Life magazine had come true. Was this actually a town without children? While delivering on the section of Moy Road where the homes still stand, Jack's father would climb up the black hillside to the field office of the engineering company working on the slide. It's a steep climb, but Jack won't do it. People on the street began to recognize me. I, you must be the Yank cameraman from New York. 
From different vantage points, they watched the removal of the material that fell upon their village. I happened upon a playground, a boy playing alone. Just outside of the Macintosh, I came upon some coal men delivering the weekly dole of coal from the colliery to the miners' families. Then the first child appeared, a toy airplane in his hand and curious as to what I was doing. I later discovered he was the first surviving child I had photographed. Jeffrey Edwards, pulled half alive from the muck in the pant glass school. Jim remained for a few days and nights gathering names for future reference and making things smoother for me to work. Then, left alone, I began to imagine my photo essay. That first Saturday night in Aberfan, I came down from my third floor room above the Macintosh pub. The pub was teeming with men in huddled clusters, sipping pints. As I began shooting pictures, Stan the publican hovered nearby. Be very wary, he cautioned. Some don't like to see cameras snapping. Not anymore, Chuck. I was met with suspicion and some hostility. The full impact of my presence in Aberfan hadn't hit me, but it sure hit some of the residents. Hours after the first reports of the disaster crisscrossed the airwaves, hundreds of journalists hurried to the village, and in some cases, were not kind to the anxious families. I was an outsider, and worse, I was a journalist. The stares and the glares unnerved me. One day I was taken aside by some of the younger miners and they warned me to leave the pub room. Guy George wanted to punch me out. Guy, I was told, was the toughest bloke in the valley. But I couldn't afford to lose face in front of these men. My work depended on their regard. So, I brought Guy a pint of what he was drinking, and in a short time we made friends. I was accepted into their world. If Di George could shake my hand, why then the Yank must be okay. John Davis lost his son Paul, who used to come straight from school to the pub and they'd walk home together. Now, John downs his pints till closing time and walks home alone. All around me, wherever I looked, I found men, mostly miners, suffering flashbacks of that dreadful day. And then, come sit down, Yank. Have a pint with us. I asked my question, where are the children? It's the parents, the ones that didn't lose any, that's keeping them off the streets. No reason to remind people that theirs had lived while others had died. By 7 p.m., the Mac was crowded. 
It was to be like this every night. The jukebox played a Tom Jones song. You know, Chuck, Tom Jones is from Pontybury, just down the road. He came here to Aberfan many times, sang at the social club he did. Teams were formed for hotly contested games of darts. In time, most patrons warmed up to me and they began to want their pictures taken. It's not unusual to go out at any time. But when I see you out and about, it's such a crime. If you should ever want to be loved by anyone, it's not unusual, it happens every day. No matter what you say, you find it... After several ales, one of the patrons began singing. He dug for days on the pond. Then got up and danced the twist. And ripped off his shirt to begin fighting his demons. Until closing time, when Stan and Pearl took a moment to forget the horrendous few weeks and the heavy weight of loss that came through this room, day and night. Each morning, my first stop was a visit to the scene of destruction. There was always something to see. Visitors, compelled as I was compelled, needing to see it, bringing their prayers, or just their curiosity. Even a TV newsreel crew returned for a follow-up, watched by a local man on Moy Road. The Mac in the afternoon was a different place. At least, it's how it felt to me. The off-shift miners and the old retired ones were more relaxed and more accepting. I showed them a recent copy of Life magazine, the story of the disaster. During the day, at any given moment, one could look out the pub window at the scene of destruction. His eyes on the tip that fell upon the children. The worst part is, I put that bloody tip up there with my own hands. I dug the slag and I sent it up that hill I did. I arranged to be taken up to the very top of tip number seven. From the top, the view of the valley was magnificent if one kept eyes on the distant hills and did not look down on the scene of destruction. A tip worker came alongside me. He told me he was right there when the tip went down. The tracks broke off sometime the night before when a large chunk of the tip collapsed, taking the rails with it. He and his mates were at the edge of the tip when, before their eyes, the whole side of the tip broke away. And the whole mess, tons and tons of it, kept spilling down into the fog of the valley and into the village, with no way to stop it, no way in hell.
About the second week, children began to appear. I stepped out of the Mac, and a little girl was standing across the street on the corner of Moy Road. Then I saw this boy walking his dog. He took me to where his house once stood, and for the first time, I could sense the deep pain this boy was feeling. His life turned upside down. He told me his brother had been killed in the pant glass school and that he had survived. Why my brother and not me? I searched for an answer he so desperately needed and could only offer. Perhaps God has a special plan for you here on earth. The surviving children were placed in a temporary school to try to bring some normalcy back into their lives. One little girl refused to enter the school. She lost her brother and she barely got out herself. I went to her home. So traumatized by her ordeal, and the realization that the brother she adored was gone forever. She would not leave her father's side. Another story appeared. A woman was standing in her doorway, anxiously waiting the return of her son, Gwyn. It was hard now for her to keep her eyes off of him. Sheila Lewis told me how she handled the burden of unbelievable grief. Last night I wrote a poem in the school book Sharon left at home that Friday morning. She recited it to us. Grief, it seems, must be our lot. Grief at times seems all we've got. I must not die and join her yet. My husband needs me. My children would fret. One of the boys running home from the temporary school was dug out of the muck that had filled his classroom, and at first, he was taken for dead. His name was David Davis. He was carried from the school ruins, laid among the still bodies of his dead schoolmates, when a nurse found he was still breathing. David's dad, Slew Davis, had a dairy farm at the edge of the village. I followed David through the passage to the fields behind his farm. David stared up at the tip that nearly killed him. As the weeks passed, I began to see more and more youngsters most all of them affected by the disaster in one way or another. Some were pulled out of the school alive. Others had siblings who had perished. At the very least, they lost their best friends. Weeks ago, there'd be four or five kids around this jukebox. How would Reese escape being swept away by the slide? He plays alone in the shadow of the tips. Yes, the ever-present tips still threaten the village. Hoping prayer would stop further grief, the Reverend Hayes prayed for the safety of the community. Every afternoon, some of the families who lost children came to pray. Leaving the streets, I wandered above the village into the hills. The children had taken to the meadows to escape the horrors of their thoughts. I found these boys just above the cemetery. 
Where they played with abandon, I couldn't help but see that they were only 100 yards from where their schoolmates were buried. It took me weeks to venture into the cemetery. Of all places in the village where I felt so great an intruder, it had to be the cemetery. Grief was as raw there as anywhere. Nothing can prepare you for the sight of the graves of a hundred children placed shoulder to shoulder in death as they had died. And in the shadow of the tips, Rain or shine, they came to visit their children, some mothers twice a day. My second home, I can't stay away. I fuss with the flowers and dress up her grave. It's like brushing her hair every morning. Seeing this young miner with coal dust on his eyes made me want to visit the Mirtha Vale Colliery. They heard the horns and the whistles blowing. They waited for the explosion. Somewhere they figured the mine was ablaze or timber had come down. But then on the phones, they were yelling big trouble at the Pentglass School. They all clamored to get on the lifts. It was their kids. Something happened to their kids. With tools in hand, they rushed to the school to dig for their children. I watched as the shift change began. Miners coming up from one mile below the surface, their day done. There was one man I wanted to meet, John Collins. His older son on the way to the senior school ran back towards his home to protect his mother and little brother when the slide roared down on him. The home was destroyed, in it, John's wife and younger son. John Collins lost them all. John was left with nothing, only the clothes on his back. No house, no family, no photos, no remembrances, nothing. Sitting in the parlor of his father's home, he reflected, it was as if that life never existed. It's all gone now. There's nothing left. I needed to seek out life events to show in photographs the renewal of the community. How do the people adjust? What do they do to create some semblance of what was lost? And who will be the first couple to wed? And who will bear the first child after the disaster? Denise Hughes sat alone in her thoughts. I could only imagine how she reconciled the pain of the tragedy two months past with the new joy of her wedding day. I could sense the change in them riding from their home to church. I myself began to change. The smile of a new bride lifted all of our spirits. Now Denise Marshall see. 
She and Gerwin had everything to look forward to in their new life. In the shadow of the tips. The first baby. The Downing family on Cottrell Street were expecting the first baby born after the tragedy. Thank you for joining us this evening for the launch of this special commemorative exhibition. I apologize for the technical hitch at the beginning. This is what happens when you have lots of rehearsals that go perfectly. <laughs> at the beginning, I was looking forward to welcoming Professor Di Smith, a leading historian and broadcaster, to introduce Chuck. I'm going to introduce Di to speak to you now. Thank you. Sometimes I think, you know, the, the best laid plans are, are, are best when things don't quite go to plan, uh, because I don't think um, any of us could have hoped for anything other than that wonderful film. Um, the tribute, I think, that uh, Chuck has paid to the people of Abervan then and now certainly brings a lump to my throat. Um, I want to say that it's a, a, an honour and, and, and a privilege to be here tonight um, at, at this particular special time. Um, you'll have noticed, um, since I can't now introduce the film, that uh, it was a Rappaport family production as well. Um, his sons Caleb and Benjamin and Mary, his wife, uh, were so deeply involved with the music, the video editing, um, the sound. Um, and it was a fantastic film, Chuck, and congratulations on that again. Um, I've met Chuck now um, three times. The first time, I think, was in Hey on Why some years ago when his book, Abavan, um, published by Parthian, came out. 
And then I went to America to make a film about the great American photographer um, whom Chuck knew and revered, W. Eugene Smith, but whom I'll say something in a moment. And we met up in Tucson, Arizona, and, and had quite a good dinner and a lot of chat. Um, so this is, in a sense, the third occasion, but uh, it's the fourth occasion, really, Chuck, in, in which we've shared the same air, because exactly 50 years ago, I was breathing the same air as you in New York City. I was a student in that autumn of 1966. I was beginning a year study at Columbia University, New York, and in that city, uh, Chuck Rappaport was a young family man, his career as a documentary photographer well underway, and of course, it took off uh, in all sorts of wonderful ways after that. We didn't, of course, meet then, but if we had that terrible October when the worst imaginable happened in Aberfan, I could have told him of the place. I could have told him of my own childhood visits from the Ronda by red and white bus via Aberdeer to my grandfather's brother's family who had come to Aberfan at the turn of the 20th century from the slate quarries of the north to work in the coal mines of the south, my Uncle Tom. I could have told him too of the grief and despair I felt in a world without mobile phones or indeed any telephonic link for my own family when I saw the pictures in the New York Times of the tip slide and I read of the horror it had brought. But that deep native sense of local valleys connection was only an add-on to the more profound, quite universal sense of human outrage and anger and pity and love that Aberfan stirred in all human hearts. As it did, of course, in the heart of a young American, the Yank who looked at his own infant son and considered in New York City the enormity of that loss far away in Aberfan and came. Aberfan, whose very name would no longer speak primarily after 1966 of place, of community, of lives lived generation by generation amidst these hills, supplying workers and families for the coal industry, but rather Aberfan, just starkly now speaking of tragedy, the scene of destruction, the disaster, as Chucker said, in the shadow of the tips of an unbearable misery, and now just in one word, Aberfan. In the entire annals of our history, which I came back in 1967 to study, in this coal field, amongst the mass deaths from explosions underground to the debilitating diseases incurred by inhaling coal dust, from life-threatening accidents and disability to early widowhood, widowhood and bereft orphans, nothing, nothing could have prepared us for the savage, heedless slaughter of the innocents and of their protectors here in these valleys on an ordinary school day in Aberfan. And I believe nothing we ever say or do in analysis or denunciation can ever make sense of it or bring any real comfort. So for a man with a camera, as Chuck said, to come into that post-tragedy Aberfan was in itself, and he must have known it, an action fraught with tension and even danger. Chuck himself will describe some of that to you in a moment and how he found his particular root amongst the ruins of emotion and numbness all around him. But I want, as I welcome him back here to these valleys, now without the coal and without the tips that he would have found and seen 50 years ago, I want to say something of what his work brought us as a legacy after he had gone home and as it still does. And that is, I believe, that Chuck Rappaport restored through his art, for that is what these great images of his are, the rhythms of particularity, the beat of specific existence that human beings always need to stave off the impossible demands of a universal condition. Slowly, carefully, patiently, with love and with immense skill, he helped give Aberfan, torn and broken, back to Aberfan, to Aberfan the place, not Aberfan the symbol. His photographs, as we've seen, and there were many new images in that video, his photographs never intrude, but they do testify. They never exploit the unwanted condition of their subjects, but they do unlock 
that unshareable otherness of grieving in a way that lets us now and then affirm our own reaching out, our own solidarity with those who had suffered. Through his time in Abavan, with the work he made here, I believe Chuck Rappaport transcended any mere recording, any documentation of what he was seeing. He invested the specific with that undeniable singularity of being, the individuality of people, which is the truly only worthwhile mark of what in its differentiation amongst us also unites us. We come together because we are different from wherever and whenever we come. It's our damned and defiant humanity. South Wales in the last century had almost too much of that for its own good. It was why we proved so expressive in our politics, so articulate in our consciousness as a working class society, so hopeful in our chains. It is why we attracted to our peculiar man-made landscapes and to our human mindscapes of consciousness, our place and our culture, why we attracted such great American photographers as Robert Kappa in the 1940s and Eugene Smith and Robert Frank in the 1950s and of course the man who came to us in 1966, Chuck Rappaport, was in and from that tradition. And from within that tradition, neither his hand, nor his eye, nor his humanity wavered. I think we have real reason to be grateful that he took the time out of his life to come and to stay and to see when perhaps we could not. Now, Chuck Rappaport has, over the past 50 years, had a stellar career as a TV and film scriptwriter, producer, and executive. But I think what we've seen tonight is the sense that, as Chuck himself said, it wasn't just Abavan that was changed. It wasn't just Abavan that lived on. It was Chuck Rappaport who changed in his own humanity. And we can be, I think, ever grateful to him for showing us uh, with such marvelous exactitude why it is that we must, as we do 50 years on, always remember. Chuck Rappaport. This was uh, actually very emotional for me. Um, I had seen this uh, video uh, three or four dozen times, but I had never seen it with an audience of people who are so closely connected to it. Um, so if you don't mind, I might just start crying in the middle of this. Um, I was 29 years old 50 years ago, living in New York City with my wife and my five-month-old son, Benjamin. When a day after the disaster happened, the newsreels came to New York on TV. And I watched in horror and amazement that so many children had been killed and so many people were trying to get them out of the, the, the dirt and rock that covered them. Now, as a photojournalist, um, generically, I was just naturally attracted to a situation that had so much drama inherent in such visual um, richness that I wanted to take pictures there. Now, I was so far away, and I was really, in a sense, a junior photographer at Life magazine. I wasn't completely recognized there by the editors uh, as being uh, qualified to do anything major. Um, but I was driven to do something about this. I think I even talked about going on my own. But I took a shot, and I went down to Life magazine and went up to see the managing editor. That's the top editor, actually, the person who controls the whole magazine. 
His name was Ralph Graves. And uh, I sat outside his office. I told his assistant I, I needed to speak to him about a story I wanted to do without an appointment. And I sat for an hour and a half and she just kept looking at me over her desk like wondering what it was that this guy won't leave. And finally, she said, okay, Ralph, we'll see you. I went into his office and he was sitting there in his shirt sleeves with his tie undone, just sleeve, you know, he just the way the Life magazine editors all seemed to dress. And uh, you know, he looked at me, he knew who I was, and he said, Chuck, what can I do for you? What, what made you sit out there so long to see me? And I said, Aberfan. And he said, oh, Chuck. We're doing a cover story on that right now. They're doing a whole news, you know, five, six pages of news on, the, on this disaster. It made it seem as though I had wasted my time. But I wouldn't leave. I just looked at him and I said, uh, no, 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 you don't understand. I, I, I want to go to Aberfan after, after it's all over, after everybody leaves. I, I want to take pictures of what it's like to be in a town without children. Well, when he heard that, he leaned back on his chair and he put his hands behind his head and closed his eyes. And I knew then that he was visualizing this spread in the magazine. And then he shouted out to his assistant. He said, get Al, Hal Wingo in here. Hal Wingo, I knew, was the uh, editor in charge of the humanities department of Life magazine, the, the, the department that would be uh, controlling a story like this. And Hal Wingo, a Texan, six foot six, came walking in and he leaned against the doorway and he said, yeah, what is it? He said, do you know Chuck, don't you? He goes, oh, yeah, hi, hi, Chuck. He says, Chuck wants to go to Aberfan, you know, that town in Wales that had that disaster. He wants to shoot a story, a town without children. He wants to live in it. And Hal Wingo said, well, that works for me. And he left. And I waited. And Ralph looked at me. And he smiled. I remember he had a crooked tooth. He, he smiled. He said, what are you waiting for? Go. With those words, my whole life changed as a photographer and as a person. Up till then, I was doing sort of average news stories, portraits, people, you know, in and out, taking pictures, not really living a story, not breathing a story. And so I packed up my bags, I kissed my wife and my kids goodbye, and I flew to London, where I was met by the bureau chief, Jim Hicks, who would eventually write the piece, the text piece in the magazine. They put me up in a hotel, I acclimated myself for a few days, and then in Jim Hicks' car we drove from London to Aberfan. Now I have to tell you that my vision of a Welsh mining town, even before a disaster, was always gray, you know, no color, rainy, wet, dirty. And when I drove into Aberfan, why, that was the picture I saw. It was raining the day we arrived. It was dirty. Most of the material that had fallen from the, from the mountain had been taken away, but there was still plenty on the streets against the curbs and in, on the sidewalks. And it was a mess. We drove around and we asked somebody if there was a hotel in town and they sort of laughed at us, you know. And they said, no, there's nothing here. And then as we were driving out of town, we saw the Mac with a sign and it said, the Macintosh Hotel. Well, wow. yeah, we were. There it is, a hotel right here. So we got out and went inside, and as you could see in the video, we met Stanley Crow and his wife Pearl, and eventually they gave us a room upstairs with two beds. We went up, cold, cold. So we got in the car and we drove to Mirtha, right here in Mirtha, and we went and we bought jackets and sweaters and rubber boots. We bought a heater. We put the heater in the car and we drove about two blocks and we said, let's get another heater. <laughs> we went back and got another heater. And while we were getting the second heater, we got a third heater. Because we had assumed that, and we were correct, 
that the heat doesn't go very far from these heaters. It's just two or three feet, so we need it to surround us. Well, we got back to the Mac and we took everything upstairs and we got an extension cord from Stanley. He didn't know why, but he gave it to us. And we plugged in the heater, this one, and we plugged the heater here. And then we extension cord out into the hallway and we plugged that one in and then we turned them all on and all the lights went out in the Mac. And there were shouts from downstairs because the, the pub was open. And Stanley shouts up, what are you guys doing up there, you know? So we told him that we turned these heaters on and then he went and he changed the fuses and life came back, but we could only use one heater at a time. After Jim left, you saw a picture of that room. After Jim left, I sat in front of that heater for, I mean, for hours sometimes, like an Indian, cross-legged, with a scarf. I don't mean to make a big deal about how I suffered, you know, because there was plenty of suffering going on around me, but, but it sure put me in the mood. Well, I want to talk about some of the incidents that happened to me. Uh, I think the video speaks for itself. You can see how I wandered the village, how I tried to plan my photo essay. I mean, Die Smith is correct. When I came into the village, you know, it was, it was a courageous moment in my life. When I went to Ralph Graves at Life Magazine and suggested they send me to this place so far away with no heat, I didn't know what I was getting myself into. And uh, uh, I, I guess I was a little bit pompous as a young photographer. I figured I could do anything. But when I got there, thank God for Jim Hicks because he, he sort of uh, grounded me. But once he left and he said, I'll see you in a week or two, I was really nervous, frightened. Um, Life Magazine had really gambled on me. They, they put a lot of money on my work. And I had to deliver for a number of reasons, but not the least of which I wanted to continue working for Life Magazine. So I had a, a notebook I brought with me, which became my journal. And I started making notes in it and uh, plans, plans for pictures. I've had a few opportunities to speak to young photojournalists who are starting out or who are thinking about being photojournalists and asking me what it takes and what, I should, what they should do, what's important, all this kind of stuff. And one of the things I tell them after realizing how I worked in Abrafan was, you've got to know what kind of pictures you want before you take them. You have to pre-conceive them. Now that might shake some people who just love to walk around with a camera and see beautiful things and take them and be happy that they've hunted well that day. Uh, but to be a hunter is not just to walk around and hope to see game. To be a good hunter, you have to know your game and you have to know where to look for it. And so that's what I was doing. I was making notes in my notebook where I would say, need a photo of a child alone, somehow evocative of the fact that there are no playmates, there are no buddies with her. So I had all these plans, not the least of which was get the first child, get the first wedding. I mean, that, that came to me eventually when I knew I had to change things. So I wandered the streets and I came upon Ronnie Davis. And you saw him, he was walking his dog he took me to where his house was destroyed, and then he told me about his brother. He told me a little bit more than what I, <coughs> well, I mean, he told, we talked about it a little bit more than what I said in the video. And it's a very interesting story and a very, very moving story for me. When Ronnie asked me why his brother died and he didn't, and he was really, no question, suffering from survivor guilt uh, of a young boy who couldn't understand why God had picked his brother away from him and his family. And so I, I did tell him at the time, I don't know how it came to me, really, I was just 29 years old and not very wise, but 
I have to tell him something. So I said, uh, I said, look, I think God has a plan for you here on earth that you should, you should do something. You should do something with your life. You should be a good man. And that will please your brother. Well, 40 years later, when I returned to Aberfan, 2006, I met Ronnie again in his home. They were doing a TV show called Children of the Valley. And they brought me to Ronnie's house. And when I walked into the house, I really didn't know who I was going to meet. But I recognized him immediately as the boy with the dog. And I had kind of completely forgot about what I had told him. So we shook hands and sort of grabbed shoulders and looked at one another, being men. You know, hi, how are you? Good to see you. And then uh, his wife, who was behind him in the kitchen, she said, oh, he never talks about the disaster, but he always talks about you. And I looked, I said, really? And he goes, yeah. And then he reminded me, he said, you remember what you told me, that I should be a, a, grow up and be a good man. And he said, and I have, I am a good man. And his, and his wife said, he is, he's been a very good man. And then I started to feel as though I couldn't hold it together. And then he walked out of the room. He disappeared for a few minutes and he came back <coughs> and he was carrying this tabletop game, a game in a cardboard box that we had given him on Christmas Day, 1966. And here 40 years later, he had it in pristine condition like it had never been used. And he said, you remember you gave, us, you gave me this game? He said, and I, I keep it, and it, it reminds me of you. And I started to cry. And he started to cry. And so I started to realize that I wasn't just taking pictures of these people. I was making an impact on their lives. And they were making an impact now on my life. This kind of connection is wonderful. It's important. And then David Davis. I heard about him in the pub when we were talking. Somebody with me, he said, did you hear about the boy David Davis, the milkman's boy? I said, no, what? Oh, yeah, he would. He died, you know, he was, in the, he was in the muck, in the rubble, he was dead. They took him out dead. They put him on the ground just with the, with the other dead kids, he said. And, and then the nurse washed his face. He was alive. His father picked him up and they took him to hospital. He's alive. He was dead and then he was alive. So I, I found out where they lived on the farm just outside of the town. And I, I walked over there and I went up and I saw his dad out front and I talked to him. I told him who I was and what I was doing and that I wanted to meet his son, and he, he introduced me to his son, and, and I took those pictures of him. It didn't end there. September 10th, 2001, you know what day that is, right? It's one day before 9-11. So my wife and I are in the south of France enjoying ourselves. It happens to be 2001, there's no internet, no Wi-Fi around, you know. There is internet, but you have to go to an internet cafe to get your email. So I did, I went up to an internet cafe and I opened my email and there's a message, an email from David Davis. He says, Mr. Rappaport, you may not remember me, I'm one of the boys you photographed in Abrafan at my house and uh, I've been looking for the magazine we had and we can't find it and we wondered uh, if you could uh, help us find, get another copy of the magazine. Well, I wrote him back and I said, of course I remember you, David. And I'll do my best when I get back to New York. And of course the next day we had 9-11 and then his next emails to me were condolence messages, you know, how things turned around, how the disaster in Aberfan and now the disaster in New York and, 
and we became friends, pen pals initially. And then uh, I talked to him about getting an exhibition of my photographs in, in Wales. And he, and he helped. And we came in 2003. We, we stayed with him on his farm in Aberfan. We, we met people. Uh, I came, I went back, I, I saw Sheila Lewis again. And uh, the woman standing in the doorway. Uh, because I had been in her house, I had had tea. Now I was going to have tea again. Um, and David was very, very instrumental in me getting the, uh, the uh, exhibition at the National Library of Wales in Aberystwyth. Um, so there was a connection there. David's still a friend, and he would be here, except he's on holiday in Malaga. Oh, too bad. Um, there was a few other stories. One story, I'm going to take a, just a moment to get this up on my phone because I had set it up perfectly, just like we had done everything perfectly. And of course, it disappeared when I came up here. And so if I can only find it, if I can only find it, I'll be right with you, fellas. Take it easy. Um, I'll vamp while I'm doing this. You remember John Collins, he's the man I photographed who lost everything. The most tragic figure that I photographed, I'm not saying that he was the most tragic figure because I wasn't in everybody's life, but uh, of the people I was with, um, that was the most tragic. So here's what happens. So what happened to John Collins? I you know, always figured, what happened to this guy? Lost everything. You know, I, I didn't mention in the video that when he came home from work that day and found his house gone and his wife and two children, he dug in the pile. He was looking for them, dead or alive, he was looking for them. So the clothes on his back, which was all he owned, were ruined. He had no clothes. It's all too much to put in captions on a, on, on a screen, but so here he was in his father's house and broken man. And let me read you something. In 2010, six years ago, out of the blue, I get an email. The name on the email is Bernice Collins. It had no meaning to me. I'm going to read you this email because it'd give you chills up your spine. Hi, my name is Bernice Collins, and I am the daughter of John Collins of Aberfan. I was doing research into my father's past when I came across your name in particular to do with a photo taken of my father, which was the reason my mother contacted him and later married him. She thinks it was in Life magazine, but it is not sure. I'm not sure as it, as it is him sitting alone, and we can't find this particular image in Life magazine. I appreciate your help in identifying the particular magazine. I wish to obtain a copy to keep as a part of our family history. Well, I answered that mail. I'm not going to read you my answer, but you can imagine how I was totally, totally stunned. And she wrote back again, because I wanted more information, and she said, I was born 5 April 1968, and my father did have a second life after Abafan. My mother says it was the story about him in Life magazine, and the picture of him sitting at kitchen table that prompted her to write to him. So yes. Your photograph helped him on the road to rebuild his life. One day, I would like to write his story, starting with the tragedy and his fight for sanity and, the just, and justice, but most of all, the love story that gave him rebirth. So it is nice to have some background to the picture. One last twist. I married a man whose Christian name is Ramon Peter. Raymond Peter, the same two names has my father's two sons, so life is strange. 
Many thanks, Bernice. Well, let me tell you how I feel about this. I sat with John Collins with a camera on my lap. Jim Hicks interviewed him. I dared to take a picture. I just sat there, stone quiet, with the camera on my lap. And Jim kept looking at me like, man, shoot, you know? I couldn't. This man was weeping in front of me and telling us how terrible life, I couldn't. I just couldn't. It seemed so, so exploitive. And finally, I, I knew I had to. So I said, Ex excuse me, John, um, do you mind if I take a picture of you? And he looked at me and he said, oh, go on, man, it's your job. Well, so I shot a, a whole bunch of pictures of him. I'm really glad I did because the pictures ran in Life magazine. So who would have known and who would have guessed that this man giving me permission to photograph him was in a way saving his life? I find it remarkable that my photograph would have affected an American woman. This is second wife was an American. I still have yet to find out whether she saw this picture in America and came over or whether she was here somewhere. But anyway, it was my photograph that made her contact him and, and a love story happened. And they were married and Bernice happened and she wrote me. I don't think there's anything more I could say about this. I think, I think I'm done. Thank you. I'd like to thank you all for coming tonight to share this opening of Chuck's exhibition, which I think you will agree is an extremely moving tribute in this 50th anniversary year. It's a tribute to the loss, a tribute to the grief, but it's also a tribute to the great strength of the Aberfan community. The exhibition will continue to run in the Keir Hardy room from tomorrow until the 29th of October. And on the 17th of October, we have a second event here in the theater with another showing of Chuck's presentation. And we will welcome two Welsh poets, Tony Curtis and Graham Davis, who will be reading their poems written in response to Chuck's photographs in both English and Welsh. I would like to thank our partners Red House and Merthyr Leisure Trust, our sponsors, Merthyr Tydfil County Borough Council and the Vos of Rahn Community Benefit Fund, whose financial support has greatly enhanced this project. Also the North Glamorgan Lodge for their very generous donation. Our thanks to everybody who has helped along the way, David Davis, Jane Hutt, Dawn Bowden, Richard Marsh, Alan Owen, Alison Reddy, Brian Toomey, Rebecca Meredith, Gus Payne, Hannah Grover, Caleb, Benjamin, and Mary Rappaport. Thank you, Di, for your very insightful contribution. I'm sorry that you didn't get to do it as an introduction, but we enjoyed it. We are very pleased that you were able to add this extra dimension for us this evening. Before you all leave, we do have a visitor's book for the exhibition, which will be on the table downstairs in the courtyard area. And we invite you to join us for refreshments. The BBC have been filming here this evening, and I know that there are several people in the audience who feature in Chuck's photographs. 
if any of you would like to speak to the BBC and say something about your experiences with Chuck Rappaport, the BBC will be outside in the corridor. Chuck, thank you for your wonderful and profoundly moving presentation. And to have your personal input tonight is very, very special. As an Aberfan girl who attended Pantglass School, this project has been particularly meaningful for me. It has been my immense privilege, Chuck, to work with you to be able to bring this exhibition here to Merthyr. You have worked long and hard putting the exhibition together, and I know that for you it has been a very emotional journey. Thank you for sharing it with us all this evening for this very significant anniversary. Chuck Rappaport.